A Celtic State of Mind has been named as one of seven finalists in the Best International Podcast category at this year's Football Content Awards. We won the Best Football Podcast Award in 2018 and it is a real achievement to be finalists once again. Thank you all for your ongoing support over the last three years. If you have been enjoying our daily content then feel free to vote for A Celtic State of Mind at footballcontentawards.com. I have added the link to the bio of this episode and the instructions and further links are also on axom.net. You can also vote on Twitter by simply tweeting I am voting for at axompod in at the underscore FCAs for hashtag best podcast. Thank you again for all your support. Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes, and once again, I'm delighted to be joined by Paul Lamb. Welcome back, Paul. Cheers, Paul. Good to be on again. It's always a pleasure. We're here again to speak about match worn Celtic jerseys. It's a subject close to your heart. You're a collector, and you have a fantastic site with various images of all the jerseys you've amassed over a period of years. And we can enjoy talking about them because you've done all the hard work. Uh, so every week, you choose four jerseys, and we talk about the pros and cons of the designs, I guess. Uh, also, the relevance of the jerseys, what memories they bring back to you, what player maybe have worn the jersey, and uh, anything else that's interesting from a collector's perspective, Paul. So, once again, you've picked two homes and two aways. Talk to us about the first home jersey you've selected. So, the first one, the home shirt we've got here is the 1985 to 87 home strip, which we, we featured the, the 84 version last week. Uh, this is a a variant on it with the, the colours being changed and the, the sponsor logo as well. On this one, it's now it's got a, a V neck collar, but it's overlapped at the V point, yeah, as opposed to the, the previous one where it was a, a traditional V neck and the green piping's been moved to the edge of the, the collar rather than running through the middle of it. Very subtle changes, Paul, but completely different look and. When I look at this jersey, when we were doing our research and various collectors were bringing in different variations of this shirt, what you noticed was, you know, just how basic the application of the sponsor was. There's loads of different sizes of sponsor, depending on when the jerseys were being worn. Some of the jerseys have a very small white patch and the CR Smith's a lot smaller. And then some of the later ones have a really big white patch with CR Smith. Don't know if Jerry Eady maybe had a go at the board at the time to make the name bigger. And then, of course, in the Scottish Cup final, which I'm sure we'll talk about at a later date on a future podcast, the CR Smith was not patched. It was actually applied to the white hoop. So the 1985 Scottish Cup final jersey was slightly different again, even though it was the same design. But as you say, it's this crossover collar which was very popular at the time and it made the jersey look completely different. Looking at this particular one, it's got all the hallmarks of a classic Celtic jersey if you can look past the fact that we now have a sponsor on the shirt. Numerous green hoops. There is the wee pinstripe on there that was introduced in the previous shirt. But this particular one has got embroidery around the crest to denote a very special game that this jersey was worn in, Paul. So can you talk us through that as well? Yeah, on, on this one, you've, all, you've still got the, the traditional large embroidered Celtic crest on it. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. just below that, on the white hoop and black stitching, it's got Roy Aitken testimonial, 86, 87, embroidered into it. Testimonials is something, Paul, that you are definitely an absolute expert in because there are a certain number of testimonials that Celtic have played for Celtic players. There's a few others that fall into the benefit category, but you made it part of your collection uh, or part of your collecting to try and track down a testimonial jersey for every game for a Celtic player. So could you just tell us a wee bit about that as well? How many testimonials, officially how many testimonials have Celtic players been granted? I've not got a... A definite number, obviously, there was testimonials throughout Celtic's history for the bigger players, Jimmy McGrory, uh, etc. 
you know, mm-hmm. and throughout the the seventies you had like uh, Bobby Lennox and Jinky Johnson and Billy McNeil having testimonials. Those games they traditionally just wore plain shirts. Mm-hmm. It wasn't until the Danny McGrain testimonial in nineteen eighty that embroidered detail denoting the game was first applied to a shirt. And since then we've now had ten players in that forty year period have had a, a testimonial from the club. Obviously the the last one or the, the most recent one rather was Scott Brown. And you know, you look at Brown and the career that he's had and you tend to think that fewer and fewer players are going to have testimonials just because the type of career he has had in the modern game, Paul, is going to be few and far between. And I say that on the one hand, but then I look at the squad and I think, well, James Forrest would probably be in line for a testimonial at some stage. But uh, Scott Brown obviously being the most recent of the testimonials. And I do remember the 1980s, there there were quite a few. You've already mentioned Danny McGrain. We had Roy Aiken. We had Tommy Burns. We had David Proven due to him having to retire. And Celtic generally played English opposition. So in terms of the game itself... For the Roy Aiken testimonial, we played Manchester United. There seemed to be, around about that time, there did actually seem to be a better kind of friendship between Man U and Celtic back then, didn't there? Yeah, it was. It was it was quite a common opposition for testimonials for Celtic. I always got the feeling, quite early on actually, that you know a lot of the time Celtic were called down or invited down. And it was just because they knew there was going to be a travelling support that came down. And it, you know, it just topped up the coffers for the players. You know, there was a lot of players that had no affiliation, affinity with Celtic. The reason is simply because we always took a huge amount of fans and the fans always behaved themselves. So that happened a hell of a lot. And obviously when Celtic had testimonials up here for our players, you did tend to have Manchester United, for example, Danny McGrain and Roy Aiken and Man U. Tommy Burns brought Liverpool up and David Proven brought up Nottingham Forest. So... The embroidery around the crest, we've already mentioned before, uh, Neely Mockham would have had someone that he went to within the locality of Celtic Park to do the embroidery for him. And this particular game finished one nothing to Celtic. Alan McAnally scoring the winning goal. Big Rambo. So you've got one of these jerseys. I think it's cracking. I love looking back on the pictures of Celtic players. And it does remind me of the type of player that we've already mentioned, the likes of Roy Aiken and Murdo McLeod. I visualise Brian McClear. You know, it was the last jersey that McClare wore as a Celtic player. There was a wee crossover between the departure of David Hay at the end of the 1986-87 season and the arrival of, of Billy McNeil. So you've got pictures of Andy Walker, for example, you know, standing with Billy McNeil at Celtic Park wearing this jersey because we hadn't introduced the centenary jersey yet. And Mick McCarthy, of course, he was signed under David Hay. Last thing he did as a Celtic manager was sign Mick McCarthy. So there's pictures of him wearing this jersey and in actual fact when we played our first game of the pre-season tour of the centenary season we were still wearing these jerseys yeah that, that tend to happen quite a lot the, the pre-season games when a, a strip was being changed over you would find them wearing the, the previous season shirts we know there's a limited amount of these jerseys about because it was specifically for Big Roy's testimonial were you able to identify who wore it against Man United that night yeah very easily because I was very fortunate enough to be gifted this by the player who wore it. It was, in fact, Paul McGugan. Outstanding. So he gifted you his jersey. So when are you getting Paul McGugan on the, the podcast then? <laughs> I don't know, where I don't know when we'll be back in the pub. <laughs> Excellent to hear that Paul McGugan gifted you this jersey and uh, Paul's doing well. Hopefully one of these days we'll hear from him on a Celtic state of mind. Some of the pivotal games that this particular jersey was worn in, I say pivotal, infamous maybe even, Atletico Madrid, uh, which was uh, played behind closed doors on the 2nd of October 85, due to issues in the previous year's competition against Rapid Vienna, uh, where a bottle was thrown into the pitch, missed the boy by about three metres, and he fell to the ground, didn't he? And he got a bandage on his head and all sorts. But anyway, that jersey was worn against Atletico Madrid. A very memorable jersey, a jersey that uh, I really do like. And moving on to the, the second one, Paul. The second jersey is an away jersey. And again, I look at that, I remember one game. When I look at this jersey, Paul, there are great memories attached to it. But there's one game in particular that I remember. And that, that was the day we clinched the 2007 league title at Rugby Park. It's black and it's green. It's vertical stripes. It is just sheer class. Talk to us about the 2006-07 away jersey. 
Yeah, well, I think you've just pretty much covered it there yourself. A uh, simple classic design, as you said, the black and green vertical stripes, the, the black floppy collar with a, an open V-neck at the bottom of it. Simple, effective, you know, it's got a traditional badge on it. It's not a single colour feature, it's a traditional three-colour badge with a, the white star above it and the Callum sponsor across it. It is a classy, classy jersey. I mentioned a few times that Nike seemed to be able to look back into the history books and resurrect earlier designs and of course they did that with this one this was a jersey that was introduced in the early 1970s originally by Umbro and it was very very similar when you look at this this Nike design wasn't it even when you look at the width of the, the actual stripes Paul and that Umbro jersey the black and green Umbro jersey unfortunately has been impossible for me to find in order to include it in the match worn jersey book the kit book that has been ongoing for some time but you think you, you know everything that you can know about certain subjects and then something else comes along so the original design of this jersey which it would be great if we did feature a match worn version of the original on this podcast at some stage Paul but at the moment it's one of the jerseys that's very difficult to find but the original one was designed by a fan so the Celtic View ran a poll back in the early 70s for Celtic fans to draw their designs of the new Celtic away jersey now I got a message fairly recently about this on Twitter this shows you the value of Twitter I know that Twitter can be a, a cesspit at times but this shows you the value of Twitter and from that message I now know who it was that designed the original jersey. I won't name him on the podcast. He's, he is going to be credited in the book. And he's also sent me the scans, the original scans of the Celtic View with his design in it. He drew a picture of George Conley and he drew this beautiful, magnificent, vertical striped Celtic jersey which was thereafter used as the away shirt. And then it was reimagined, uh, if you like, much, much later on and worn with some style by the likes of Nakamura. And this... Reminds me of that particular game. We're going to speak to you, Paul, about the game that this one was worn in. But just interestingly, and this is a podcast that, that's also going to be uploaded onto a Celtic State of Mind very soon. I spoke to Saul Davis from the band James. And I know, Paul, that you have a fairly similar reference point music-wise to myself. And I think about James and I think about... It. It's one of the bands that have, have been a constant over the la- about the last 30 years in my record collection. And I won't say too much about the podcast. Go and listen to it. Saul Davis is a lovely fella. And we are supporting an initiative that he's set up. But he was talking about the relationship that Tim Booth has with Gordon Strachan. And Tim Booth and Strachan became friends when Strachan was at Leeds. Tim's a Leeds fan. Gordon Strachan describes the two of them as like chalk and cheese, but they're very, very close. So as a result of that, Strachan used to get tickets for them for various games. He got tickets for Saul to go to the Scotland England game, the two each game, things like that. So one of the one of the Celtic games that he got the entire band tickets for was the Kilmarnock League clincher at Rugby Park. So Saul Davis tells a story on the podcast. So listen to it when it comes out, about the full band are behind the goals. Not the goals when Nakamura scored, the other side of the pitch, and the full band are standing there watching Celtic, and they're, they're annoyed because Strachan just giving them normal complimentary tickets rather than an executive box, you know? <laughs> but it's great, it's brilliant. So I remember this jersey for that particular game. What game was your jersey actually worn in? This one was quite easy to suss out because it's been handily signed and dated on the back of the shirt. It's a number 12 worn by Mark Wilson mm-hmm. and it's been dated 9-8-06 which was an away game. It was a strange one. It was a, a friendly played after the beginning of the season so we'd already played two league games and we were still playing friendlies and it was a game down at Stamford Bridge against Chelsea. Yeah, 1-1. One, one. Gary Caldwell scored for Celtic and Sean Wright Phillips scored for Chelsea that day but I'm looking at it just now and I think we've already mentioned we would have been quite happy with a, another version of that kind of template had Adidas decided to go for that this jersey yeah so it was worn in the friendly by Mark Wilson Mark Wilson who plays for the Celtic Greats who are sponsored by a Celtic State of Mind and who is now the Brecon City manager so when you look at this particular jersey I think of Naka you think of Mark Wilson playing against Chelsea at Stamford Bridge but that's what jerseys do. They spark these ideas and these memories in your mind. But we've mentioned the new jerseys. Paul, let's have a wee chat about the, the home and away. I'm guessing they are 100% the new jerseys that we've seen this week. 100% anyone's guess. You know, it's the, they've been leaked by a fairly accredited website. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of credibility behind them. But like everything else, until it's officially unveiled, it's anyone's guess. I've got a question for you then, right? Because you do see these, there's various very, very good websites and they're dedicated to kit design and new releases and 
obviously they talk about retro jerseys and there's blogs and they are pretty much on the ball when it comes to new releases. And I've often wondered if kit manufacturers deliberately leak pictures just to test the water. But then I'm thinking it would be too late by this stage to say, no, actually, we're not going to design that one. We're going to change it. And obviously, had that been the case, the silver and pink design for last year would never have seen the light of day. Do you think there's anything in that theory that maybe the, the shirt designers deliberately leak them out? You've got an operation there, but of course, if they are subcontracting the manufacturer of the jerseys, as we know they do, all it takes is someone somewhere in a factory to take a wee picture, isn't it? Yep, as tight as they try and make security, there's always a lap somewhere. So, what's your thoughts on the home jersey? There's a bit of gold, I would guess. You could call it gold or yellow, but there's a wee bit of that in it. I think it works an absolute treat, though. Yeah, the, the image that's been leaked, yeah, it's got a kind of gold piping on the, the round neck collar. Mm-hmm. It's a really nice working, but Adidas, the round collar, as opposed to a V-neck, you yeah. could probably debate the benefits either way to most people's preference, you know. Another thing as well, which is quite incredible, you add those Adidas three stripes onto the shoulders, and it just adds... A bit of class to it as well. It looks great. We've all been talking about it, Paul. You and I have spoke about it. Adidas would have always been the kind of go-to manufacturers. It's finally happened. And the away jersey that we've seen, the black one, with, I don't know how you would describe that colour of green, mint green. Yeah. I love what they've done with the badge. What's your thoughts on that? Again, the badge is a bit confusing for me, as in it's not a traditional Celtic badge for a football shirt. You know, it's... It looks more like the kind of thing you see on the, the leisure wear, the polo shirts yes. you get nowadays, you know, rather than a football shirt. I know over the last few seasons, was it two years ago, the, the white away strip that had a, a variant of a Celtic cross on it? Yes. Aye. You know, so there is scope for an alternative, but whether that is the final design, you know, uh, I'm not too sure. So the black one's got the V-neck and it's got the Adidas, the three stripes, underarm right to the very bottom of the jersey. As I say, it's this kind of mint green colour against the black. The badge, they're probably looking at the crest thinking, like you say there, people might want to wear that for leisure wear. You know, if you bought that without the sponsor. It's a football jersey, of course it is, but it's, it, it kind of veers towards the kind of leisure wear as well. I remember the polo shirts, they did them and there was a bright yellow one that Beram Kaya wore and it looked brilliant, what they did with the crest. From an aficionado's perspective, Paul, would you rather... That left the crest as it was? I think, you know, as I said, there is a scope with it being done previously with a Celtic cross design, which has been a traditional variant on a Celtic badge. Mm-hmm. This is a completely new design that would appear on a, a shirt that we've never seen before, you know, so I think it's instantly it's, you're either going to like it or you don't, and it could grow on you. You know, it's one of those ones. Oh, definitely. And what we'll do next, Paul, for the third jersey, although it's not going to be in date order, we'll go back to the home jersey. So the second home jersey that you've selected here, it's from Nike on a personal level, and I'll explain why. It's one of my least favourite Celtic home jerseys. So this is the, the home shirt from 2013 to 2015. So talk us through this one then. There are some noticeable changes, if, if you like, on the hoops. So this is uh, Nike's last home shirt that they produced for the, the club before we changed to New Balance. A parting gift. Yeah, it's their take on, their last take on the hoops. It's essentially got five large green hoops across it, but the green hoops are all separated with white lines running through it Mm -hmm. to almost break up into individual green hoops. Caused quite a bit of a stir at the time. Again, it's the the traditionalists just want the plain green and white hoops. Don't like them being tampered with at all. I think if they're tampered with, you've got to do it right. You've got to do it right. If you're going to make a change... You know, because you feel that certain aspects of previous jerseys have been too similar, that's fine. But you look at the hoops, it just doesn't work. I mean, it was, it broke it up and it was supposedly split into seven hoops to pay homage to the iconic Celts who wore the famous number seven. I mean, they'll find a market employ around anything to try and explain their design or their error. And of course, number seven is synonymous with Celtic. I mean, I don't know if it's the same with, with all other clubs, but you think number seven, the first player you think of is Jimmy Johnson. And then you think of Henrik Larson. And then you go into the number seven lounge at Celtic Park and who they got up in the glass, Nadia Chiefchi. Freddy Lundberg. Seriously. <laughs> so, let's not talk about them in the same breath as Larson and Jinky, but I, I just, I don't think it worked. And again, I think across the piece, it's a Celtic jersey and it'll sell, but definitely not one of my personal favourites. Uh, do you think it worked? Again, it was when it first came out, it was instantly, you know, thinking, no, 
that's not for me. But over the, the period it was worn, it does grow on you. You know, it's, it's never going to be a classic. Over the, the first season it was worn, it did become accepted, you know. There was also the, the theory. Now, by the way, some of the conspiracy theories you read on Twitter, but there was the theory that it was uh, almost a market employ for Magnus because it was very similar to the logo that was on the front of the shirt. So it was in keeping with that, whether or not that was a coincidence, who knows. Talk to us about the specifics of the jersey as well, Paul. The specifics of this one, it's a, a European spec player shirt. Uh, it's long-sleeved version. Again, as tradition was with, with night player shirts at the time, it's got the what they call the, the laser cut vent holes down the, the side of each each side of the, the shirt for ventilation. This one is a Europa League patches applied to it. And on the reverse, it has... Three quarters of the back of the shirt is a plain white panel, so that the the name set and number are clearly visible on it. Whose name's on it, Paul? Uh, this one, it's the early number 28 of Lee Griffiths. He is one of the players, actually, when I look at that jersey, one of the players that I think of is Lee Griffiths wearing that jersey. I also think of Van Dyke as well wearing that. This was basically the end of Neil Lennon's Celtic career, first time round as a manager. This was the last jersey that, that Neil wore. And then obviously it was worn when Lennon's replacement came in and Ronnie Dyler. When you look at the sponsor as well, there's, there is an alternative to this. And that was when we played Shakhtar Karagandhi. In 2013, the Magnus was replaced with Tipperary Natural Mineral Water. And that was due to restrictions on alcohol advertising in Kazakhstan. Again, not the first time Celtic have done that. We've already spoken about sponsors getting changed in America to Coors Light uh, rather than Carlin because Carlin is predominantly a, a UK brand. Yeah, looking at the jersey then, I mean, it's a European match worn stroke prepared for Lee Griffith's jersey. What game was it prepared for, Paul? To be honest, I was supplied with details when I got this shirt, but again, I was never able to prove it conclusively. So to me, this is just a, a player issue shirt. You know, I wouldn't stake anything on it being from a specific game. It does have uh, signs of wear. It's got dirt on the cuffs mm-hmm. and things like that. But again, that could be somebody wearing it to play five or sides before it ended up with me, you know. Yeah. The final jersey of today's podcast, Paul, again, it's a wee step back in time because it was a reimagining of a classic design. Or was it a cult classic design? It was the Bumblebee kit's second coming. Talk to us about this. I look at that jersey, I think Robbie Keane. Yeah, instantly. It's the first player that comes to my mind. Robbie Keane, a player who I wish Celtic had had for a lot longer than they did. And I think he was made for Celtic. And when you looked at him, you know, if he played a full season, Paul, he's the type of player who would have scored at least 30 goals for Celtic. Robbie Keane, what a goal scorer. Absolutely dynamite when he was up here. But he was playing in a, a team that initially lacked a lot of self-belief under Tony Mowbray. And obviously, for the final few games under, under Neil Lennon, uh, he also appeared. And I, I remember the, the famous hat-trick he scored against Kilmarnock. The guy was dynamite. So, talk to us about the jersey, first of all. Did Nike get it right when they were trying to recreate the Bumblebee? Yeah, I think they got it spot on with this. It's a simple hoops design for an away shirt. The alternative colourway, it's the black and luminous hoops mm-hmm. on it. You know, it's very simple. It's not no shadow detail in the background, just plain block colours throughout it. Again, it's another one. It's got the a single colour badge on it. You can either take or leave that. You you know, it's a personal choice. And it's the luminous colours used for the, the night swoosh on the shirt as well. I mean, I'm looking at that, and again, you can associate certain jerseys with the era that they were used. And you might look upon a jersey and not like it because we were very unsuccessful, as we were at that time. But on reflection, I'm looking at it, and it is quite a classy design. I just love the fact that we've got the hoops. I love Celtic wearing the hoops, and we've said on the podcast a few times, green and black hoops at some point, you would you would imagine, might make an appearance. I remember the marketing campaign, uh, the home in on Paul McStay's famous quote, there's a buzz about the place. I remember going up the Celtic Way and seeing the B and uh, the slogan, there's a buzz about the place. If you were to compare this, Paul, with the original Bumblebee, which one do you prefer? For me, the original Bumblebee is always going to win, hands down. You know, it's just the original one. It's just uh, the memories it evokes, the, the the players who wore it, you know. Yeah. A, a magical time. Some amazing football played by those players. Absolutely. A, a different era. It, again, it was just, it was when it first came out, it was just something new and fresh. Obviously, this is a, a remake. We'd seen it before. Mm-hmm. So it's just a, a reworking of it, as you've said. You know, the, the original one that will always draw you back to it first. It's interesting. I totally agree with you. And it is interesting because if you were probably 
to line up a designer or a, a group of designers to look at the, the two of them side by side and they had no Celtic connections whatsoever, they would probably say that the reworked design was a better design. You know, there was a lot of flaws with the original, but you ask Celtic fans, they'll go for the original every time, I think, you know. Some of the players that wore this, we've already mentioned Robbie Keane. We also had Mark Antoine Fortuny, Zeng Zi, Landry and Gemo. So there was a few others that you might remember wore this particular jersey as well. My favourite, sir. Listen, we might get them on the podcast, Paul. Who knows? They played with Celtic. That's good enough for me. Again, it was one of the jerseys that went through a few changes in, in relation to the sponsor. There was other versions of this jersey with, with newer sponsors on it as well. What about the, the match specifics or the player specifics for this particular jersey? Again, this one, it's a, a European spec player shirt, long sleeve version. Again, it's the, the Europa League sleeve patches on yeah, it yeah. and the respect patch on the other sleeve. Similar to the, the previous home shirt, this away shirt has a, a black panel three quarters of the way on, on the back of the shirt so that the the white name and number stands out clearly against it. This one is prepared for Aidan McGeady with number 46 on the back of it. Aidan McGeady. We've spoken about Gordon Strachan on this podcast and I think Tim Booth has a better friendship with Gordon Strachan than Aidan McGeady does. Going by what we've heard from other players, but McGeady, yeah, he was one of these players, Paul, he came through, I think, up to a certain point. He looked like a very, very exciting prospect and he, I felt, for a long time, could have gone on to to much greater glory had he stayed at Celtic. You know, I know that he'll retire a very rich young man uh, after all his various moves from country to country big money moves at times and Celtic certainly made a few quid off of Aidan McGeady as well but because he had come through the ranks he was one of the guys that I just wanted to spend a lot more time at Celtic I felt that under Gordon Strachan he became a bit stale and that was unfortunate and you know maybe with the introduction of Mowbray I looked at him and I thought Mowbray wanted to play with two wide men didn't he initially and I thought that uh, McGeady got a new lease of life and then obviously what happened with regards to Mowbray happened and just talking about Mowbray it's bringing back the infamous final game of Mowbray's tenure against St Mirren where we were beaten 4-0 and we wore this kit as well so it's maybe not as fondly remembered because of that as well after a result like that you're going to get your jotters at Celtic Park very much like John Barnes after Inverness Cali Thistle you're going to get your jotters after a result like that so good memories and bad but it's always good to revisit the Bumblebee years Paul and I look forward to next week once again rummaging through your match worn jerseys where can we find you online if any of our listeners want to check out your collection yeah, again, uh, all the all the shirts featured today and previous can be checked on www.myceltixshirts.co.uk. Absolutely, Paul. All that's left for me to say is thank you once again for joining me on a Celtic State of Mind. No problem. Enjoy that again, Paul. Celtic State of Mind has been named as one of seven finalists in the Best International Podcast category at this year's Football Content Awards. We won the Best Football Podcast Award in 2018 and it is a real achievement to be finalists once again. Thank you all for your ongoing support over the last three years. If you have been enjoying our daily content then feel free to vote for a Celtic State of Mind at footballcontentawards.com. I have added the link to the bio of this episode and the instructions and further links are also on axom.net. You can also vote on Twitter by simply tweeting I am voting for at axompod in at the underscore FCAs for hashtag best podcast. Thank you again for all your support.